It uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Rajesh Kasturi Rangat. He is an associate professor at the National Institute of Advanced Studies. His research interests are cog in cognitive science and philosophy of mind. His current work relates to applying a combination of philosophical argument, mathematical techniques, and empirical <coughs> observations to classical pro problems in cognitive science. And the philosophy of mind, such as uh, the semantics of uh, natural languages, the epistemology of beliefs, and the structure of intentionality and consciousness. His most significant research contribution has been to develop a computational theory of how language and concepts are grounded to the world, in the world. And uh, he will be speaking on the enselved mind, and which he'll explain, uh, and eye of the beholder, right? Dr. Kapoor, uh, Professor Srikantan, and Professor Sinha, and Professor Menon. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I have to say that I kind of like the enslaved mind a lot better than the enslaved mind. I'm going to stick to that. Uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, it, the enslaved mind also, I think, is an enslaved mind, but let's not. So I'm going to start with a somewhat provocative claim. In this, this morning, we heard, I think, uh, uh, Professor said, talk about how, uh, you know, the mind is a mystery. No, consciousness is a mystery. Uh, quantum mechanics is a mystery. Therefore, they must be the same, right? Uh, and there are many people who I think justly are skeptical of that claim. So I'm going to throw out another claim that I think is equally problematic and which, as it so happens, is the standard party line. And, and the claim is, the mind is a mystery, the brain is a mystery, therefore the two must be the same. And I think that that is as problematic and wrong a claim as the mind is a mystery and quantum mechanics is a mystery, the two must be the same. So why? And what I'm going to try to convince you is that the self is a better locus for trying to explain the mind than either the brain or the body. but Hopefully, I mean, th think about this a little bit like science fiction or fiction science. I don't have any real, it's an argument, it's an abstract argument, so I'm not going to offer you lots of data. We've had excellent presentations today which have lots of data in them. So I'm going to do something which theorists do, which is to just say something is true, and hopefully it might be at some point. But even if it's not, think of it as a good just-so story, okay? So the question I want to pose you is, should the mind sciences be replaced by the self sciences? Right? That is the self really the location in which the mind should be explained, among other things, including the body, including the brain, including the immune system, for example. Okay, but I'm not going to talk to you about the immune system. And the quick answer I want to give you is that Yes, it should, and the reason is because organization trumps representation. And what do I mean by that? Many of the talks that we heard today are about representation, right? And, the, you know, there's a famous quote by Jerry Fodor, the philosopher, which says, every idea has two lives, first in philosophy and then in cognitive science. Actually, I think that every idea has three lives now. First in philosophy, second in cognitive science, and third in neuroscience. So sadly, I think bad ideas make their way down the chain of whatever you might want to call it, philosophy, cognitive science, neuroscience. So one bad idea, I think, is the idea of representation, that somehow either the mind or the brain uh, represents the world, and therefore, in order to study the mind, really what you need to figure out is how that representation is done in the mind or in the brain. Computation, information, however you want to do it. And, and I think that that's a bad idea. But I'm not going to tell you why, except maybe a few hints here and there. Instead, I think that organization, and as you know, self-organization is a very interesting and important idea in a lot of sciences, especially in physics. And in that sense, it's not as if 
Physics has nothing to say about the mind. It's just not quantum physics, but the physics of self-organization and complex systems, which I think many people wouldn't disagree with, except that in order to understand the mind, the questions of self-organization that pop up are not the same as what you would see if you wanted to understand uh, clouds or snowflakes or the other kinds of things that physicists think about. So if the self is the organizer and organization is the most important thing, then self-organization trumps representation. Okay? So first, let's look at how one understands the mind. And there's the standard party point. So what are the basic problems of mind? Right? If you open your standard philosophy of mind book, you'll probably see these three topics in them. Reason, consciousness, and intentionality. Right? Reason is how we reason. And incidentally, what's interesting about it is unlike physical movements, rational thought is normative. Right? You can't tell an electron that you're wrong to move from one place to another, but you can definitely tell somebody who says, a implies B, therefore B implies A is wrong. So there's a normativity to thought and reason which is not there in physical causality. So incidentally, Descartes, among others, points out that that's the reason to see, to say that the physical body is different from the reasoning soul. So res extensa is different from res cogitans. Consciousness, right? And this is where there are various questions about Hard problems, soft problems, easy problems. Do animals have consciousness? I'm not really going to deal with those, but everybody agrees that any understanding of the mind eventually has to engage with the problem of consciousness, and in particular, the problem of qualia, right? which is what is it like to see or hear or touch something? And finally, it is intentionality. Intentionality is the property of mental states of being about something else. So it's not enough that we are conscious. It's that our conscious states are about other things. So when I dream of, uh, what does it do? What was that famous book? Uh, Philip K. Dick Novel, I think, right? Uh, do cats dream of electric sheep or something like that? No, do robots dream of electric sheep? So um, maybe they don't. Uh, do androids dream of electric sheep? Um, and if they do, well, it would be a pretty fantastic dream, but uh, the question is that when you dream of electric sheep, your dream is yours, but the electric sheep are not. And for the most part, it's intentionality that lets your mind get out of your head, right? Because when I see a cup, the perception is mine, but the cup is outside. And that's the really interesting thing about the mind. And the standard model, which works quite well, at least to understand reason, is that the mind is a computer, right? That, the, that somehow it is computational processes that help us model, understand what it is to be a reasoning being. And this has worked really, really well in language. It has worked really well in vision. And it is increasingly being used to understand vision, language, and other cognitive processes, not just in humans, but in other animals. Right? In fact, the language of information processing is now the standard language with which we talk about any mental process. Okay? But there are problems with the standard model. Incidentally, the standard model is also based on representation, because the claim is that the mind is nothing but computation on representations. Right? So you don't see the red rose. You actually represent the red rose as some computational structure which comes from doing information processing on the input that comes to your retina and so on and so forth. But as it turns out, even reason isn't reasonable. And of course, as many people have pointed out, the computational theory of mind really doesn't say anything at all about consciousness or intentionality, really nothing worth writing about. So, but why is even reason not reasonable? And that is actually some very important work that was done in the cognitive sciences. So one thing one has to give to the computational theory of mind is that it made possible to have very precise accounts of how the mind works. So other people could come and tell you why it doesn't work that way. Right? So an example of that is various kinds of 
seemingly predictably irrational ways in which we behave. So I'll give you one example of that. Um, Kahneman and Tversky uh, and Kahneman got a Nobel Prize for it. They did a lot of work on the kinds of seemingly irrational behavior we have, which is that we are more likely to, to you know, we are, we are loss averse, okay, as a species. So if, if from an ideal rational being's point of view, if the expected outcome of two experiments is the same, you should behave the same in the two situations. But it turns out that if the loss in one is greater than the loss in the other, we actually are much more cautious in the case where it's lossy. So you can see that this is actually not irrational from an organismic point of view. If something is going to kill you, you want to be careful about it. But at least from a standard rationality theorist perspective, that's not the way to behave. Okay? But there are other kinds of heuristics we use. And, and it seems that instead of the kind of strict logical rules that people thought we should have as computational engines, we are much more flexible, much more soft, and we have heuristics rather than rules. So that's one discovery that has made its way throughout the cognitive sciences. Another example of that is the work by Eleanor Roche and others on concepts. So Eleanor Roche, if you have a concept, again, so let's take the concept bird, right? You would think that if it is stored as some kind of logical schemata, a computational schemata, then all birds are the same, right? A bird is a animal that flies and has lays eggs and so on and so forth. So it's an abstract uh, definition, and so every bird is the same as every other bird. But actually, people are not like that. Right? The way people represent, if I want to use that term, the concept bird seems to distinguish between sparrows and penguins. And uh, my bet would be monkeys probably differentiate between whatever birds that they see around them and penguins. So this might be an experiment to run on monkeys, right? As in, what are the prototypical birds for them? So it turns out that human beings recognize re, um, reason, all of those things, with certain kinds of prototypical features much better than others. And so once again, it's sort of a blow to the computationalist view of the mind. So all of these lead to something called embodied cognition. And embodied cognition is a theory of the mind, which says that the mind is really constituted by bodily processes, which is very different from saying that the mind is in the brain, right? Or the brain is the mind. Because first of all, it's not just the brain, it's the rest of the body, and there's a lot of it which is not in the brain. And more importantly, it's about how the mind is constituted, not how it is represented. And this is a very important distinction. And and it has led to some remarkable kinds of experiments. So here's a very counterintuitive experiment that people have done, which is, sub again, unsuspecting um, experimental subjects who were um, standing around, and they were told that they had to interview somebody and form an opinion of that person. And while they are waiting in the line or waiting in the room to interview somebody, someone comes and hands them either a cup of warm tea or a cup of cold, let's say, a Coke, right? You would think this has nothing to do with how they're going to do in the interview. It turns out that systematically, the people who are handed a warm cup of tea judge the person in front of them better than the person who was handed a cold Coke. So the fact that the temperature, so to going back to inventing temperature, it turns out that the temperature of the liquid that you hold in your hand actually affects the way you think about the person in front of you. So this is a very stark example of how the body is somehow constitutive of our thoughts. This is not just the brain, right? It's embodied. It's actually something in your hand, not just in your head. Okay. But when you try to analyze the body, it turns out that the body is a rather difficult thing to understand because the standard understanding of the body is what physicists tell us what bodies are. While Newtonian physics tells us bodies are one kind of thing, 
that kind of thing obviously cannot have mental states, right? We don't, I mean, if you think that quantum physics has something to do with consciousness, I don't think there's a single person in this room who thinks Newtonian physics has something to do with consciousness, right? And yet, we are macroscopic bodies, we are not microscopic bodies, and yet we are also conscious beings, and therefore one has to ask anybody who says the mind is embodied, well, how? Right? I mean, yes, there is experimental evidence now being collected that the mind has some bodily basis, but how is it possible for the body to be constitutive of the mind? We really don't have a very good idea, right? Because again, the mind is very internally differentiated. It's not differentiated in the way that the body is. So there are all these questions about how the mind works, especially as a body. So which brings me to the real topic of the presentation, which is the self. There are many, many definitions of what the self is. Tomorrow we have an entire day uh, to understand what the self is. Uh, I'm just, this is a good segue perhaps. So the self, as far as I am concerned, is really the answer to the question, or which is the problem that I want to pose, right? What is the field in which the mind is constituted? So going back to the body, embodied mind issue. The embodied mind says that the mind is constituted through the body. And I'm just saying, instead of just taking that as a given, let's ask it as a question. How is the mind constituted? Right? And, and I think phenomenologists and others would, are, would agree that somehow the lived world is a good place to start to try to understand the mind. But I think that the Indian term samsara actually is a much better way to capture that term, the lived world, than any um, neologism of that kind, okay? Because I think that is exactly the problem that the Indian philosophers were uh, thinking about. So I'm just gonna give you another neologism though, which is that the problem of trying to understand the lived world is what I call the problem of the structure of stable signification, right? Which is that the self-organizing mind is not just organizing itself, it perceives the world as a stable, it's not a blooming, buzzing confusion in the way that William James thought it was, but rather a stable world in which percepts are of coherent 3D objects, thoughts have proper reference. So when I think of cups and there's a cup in front of me, somehow there's a connection between my thought and its object. There's a connection between my emotions and their object. So if you think about consciousness, intentionality, and reason as a triad, then there's a stable way in which this triad comes together to understand the layout of the organismic world, right? To you, Gibson, the famous perceptual psychologist, Gibson says, really the question to understand for perceptual scientists is not the brain or representation, but the layout of the visual environment. And I'm just saying, replace the visual environment by the environment in all the senses and including thoughts. So make that the layout of the organism, in which case we have to understand how is that layout laid out. So that organization, however, is not out there, right? It's not independent of us. It actually is co-dependent on the kinds of minds and bodies that we have. And there are three levels at which this life world or samsara is organized. One is at the level of the species itself, the life world of humans, right, in which we are bipedal mammals, and therefore, things like in front, in back, these kinds of distinctions make sense to us. If you are a puffer fish, maybe it doesn't. But the geometry of the living world is different for different species. Nothing fantastically new about that. But it also tells you that that world is perceived by us as coherent and as one entity without any breaks. And this is why something like the blind spot is an interesting phenomenon to understand, right? The computationalist model of the blind spot, everybody I hope knows what the blind spot supposedly is, right? It's that part of your retina where there are no optic nerves, and therefore the claim is that when you're seeing the world, your brain is filling in all those gaps. But actually, that's not the right way to think about the blind spot, because there is no gap. As far as your self-organized world is concerned, it's, it's, it's different from poking out a hole in your visual field. In fact, 
there is, your world is constituted in such a way that the blind spot doesn't exist. It's really, really blind in that sense. Right? It's, it's the kind of thing that an Indian philosopher of a certain kind would say, it's limitless ignorance. Right? It's not limited ignorance. It's the kind of ignorance that you are simply incapable as a being to comprehend. But then there is also the generic world, which is the world in which things kind of behave the way they always do. So for example, as, again as a bipedal species, if I'm walking around, I know that things have backs to them. So if I'm watching something from its front, I know that generically it has the kind of back that it's used to. So when I'm looking at the chairs here, I would be really surprised if they had spikes in their back. So generically, we have an understanding of how the world works. So this is not at the species level, because obviously it changes from one kind of local environment to another. But in a certain kind of local environment, things behave regularly in systematically predictable ways. And this generic environment is also tied to my kind of special beingness. Right? It's not ants and human beings don't have the same kind of generic environment to them. So the genericity, however, is very important. It's also, incidentally, crucial to the way we reason. Right? And for, give me, let me just give you an example. When we say dogs have four legs, well, that seems like definitional. Right? Because generically, dogs have four legs. But there are some lame dogs who have only three legs. So would you say that therefore dogs have four legs is false? You wouldn't. Most people would say that dogs have four legs, and yet some dogs have three legs. So if you're a mathematician, the theorem dogs have four legs is false. But in everyday reasoning, dogs have four legs is somehow true. So the way we cognitively represent truth is tied to this generic level rather than either to the species level or to the individual level. I mean, these are the kinds of, so what I'm saying is that philosophical questions and cognitive and computational questions are actually tied to the kind of level at which you analyze them, okay? But finally, of course, you have your own world, that is to say you as an individual, which is, of course, classically the level most associated with selfhood. So um, when you say, <clears throat> you know, I like rock music and I hate Carnatic music, or the other way around. Or if you say, Carnatic music is the only music worth listening and rock music is for, you know, barbarians. Both of those are in your eye world, right? And this too has its particular kind of illusions and errors. So if you have Capgras syndrome, where you start suddenly believing that your wife has been replaced by an imposter, your own world furniture has changed, right? So in your, so think about ontology and metaphysics not as something that philosophers should think about, or only philosophers should think about, but also cognitive scientists and animal scientists, right? Which is to say that the particular kind of world you inhabit is also gives you a certain kind of metaphysics and ontology. And in the ontology of a person who has Capgras syndrome, there are only imposters, there are no wives. Right? And that's a very interesting kind of finding because it goes to the core of what do you mean by the denotation of the term I. So if you are a linguist <clears throat> and you want to ask who does the term I refer to and you, well, and who, what do proper names refer to? So when you say I am Rajesh, well, a Capgras syndrome person, it would be an interesting question to ask. What names do they use for this person that they think has been replaced by an imposter? So is naming tied to the person, or is it tied to the appearance? I don't know. I mean, these are things that I'm sure a neurologist will have to think about a little bit. So, so in particular, so just to um, recapitulate, each level of analysis of the self does its own important thing. Okay? And the self is the locus that gives meaning to all these levels. That's my claim, right? And that's, so that's the just-so story I'm trying to sell you here, which is that it's only through the coherence-making operation of the self as a self-organizer that the world makes sense. That whether you, so again, to use a good pun, if you think of the world making sense and sensing the world and sensation and sensational, all of these are tied to 
something that makes sense of all that sense, right? And that is the self. And so the self is the organizer of the world around you. And if you have a blind spot, as a species, there are certain things you can't do. So may, I don't know if there are absolute blind spots, in which case you, know, you can't really know what it's like to be a bat. Or maybe there are only relative blind spots. I don't know. And of course, at the generic level, there might be various kinds of illusions. So if you see a rope and you think it's a snake, that's a kind of illusion at the generic level, right? Because what you've done is you have imposed something that could be the case on a stimulus that actually doesn't really um, bear that responsibility, okay? And of course, and Cape Capgrass and other syndromes uh, lead to a problem at the eye level. So what I want to uh, say is that the self, therefore, is an entity that spans many levels, right? Unlike what Magmanta said yesterday, it can't be scale-free. There are distinctive things that you do at each level. So my world can't be subsumed under the generic world, which can't be reduced to the species world and the other way around, but there are continuities between these three levels. And in that sense, the self and the biological organism and the species is a graded kind. So I'll just explain what that means. Right? A graded category... So graded category is exactly like the category bird, right, where different elements of that category have different valences. So sparrows are more important to you than penguins in representing bird. So a graded kind is nothing but an actual, a physical entity that cannot be represented just at one level. Right? So it is differentiated across levels. So again, this, this to me in a sense, violates my usual idea of an object, because an object is something which has a definite locus. But I think that the self and the mind in general are distributed entities rather than you know, self-enclosed entities. If you're a Buddhist, you'll probably like that, right? because you know that it arises co-dependently with other things. OK, so to conclude, what I want to say is that the self is an abstract principle rather than just the physical body itself. But it is an abstract principle that has a dialectical relationship with the mind and the body. And it is that which organizes or helps organize both of those. I mean, that's at least what I would like to believe the self can do. And that's why it's the eye of the storm, right? And to conclude, we should therefore move from the computational mind, which is the standard party line, and I hope all of you do learn some computation, but also take it with a pinch of salt, to the embodied mind. But even that is not good enough, and we should move to the in self mind. Thank you. And I wanted to see, because this is. Uh, sort of been my topic for about half a century. Uh -huh. So I wanted to see what you thought of uh, a kind of embedding of what I heard you said, which, uh, if I'm not wrong, is quite compatible. Okay. And you had a couple of very nice uh, notions at the end, that the self is an abstract principle, and it's the self-organizer of one's experience in world. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that this is the basic intuition under phenomenology, where there's an I-it relation and everything's organized, mm. organized around that. But also, the part of my uh, field has been a study of significance of standard meditation experiences uh -huh. for questions like this. Mm -hmm. And one of the standard experiences, if you settle down, uh, I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow, but not in this context. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk with someone about this, but mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. You settle all the way down, and there's nothing there. And okay. for Buddhists, call it Shunya, you can call it Sat, I mean, different mm -hmm. language. You Taoists call it Wu. Mm -hmm. So you go all the way down, there's nothing. And if you're in coming out, you, or as you're going in, it's slow enough, mm -hmm. there's a particular experience of nothing but a perspective or vantage point mm -hmm. on emptiness. Okay. And it strikes me that what this is, is this is the self, is that vantage point, consciousness with a uh, uh, it's sort of focus that has a locus. Mm -hmm. And the surrounding emptiness is the empty phenomenological manifold. Mm -hmm. 
Isn't it a locus that has a focus? I'm sorry. I yeah, feel like... it's the locus. <laughs> it, the focus is what creates the locus, okay. right? right? It's the focus of just awareness itself. Uh -huh. And so you're in the empty phenomenological manifold. So it seems to me that the self is more than just a principle. Uh -huh. The self is that which underlies the principle. It's a real phenomenological existent. And if we hold that, then everything that I heard you say, in rough outline, would seem to be nested. Okay. Does that make any sense to you in rough? Uh... Uh, I, I, I won't argue with you about anything here. The only thing I would say is we use the term principle, and especially abstract principle, to mean something that is not real. But actually, right. I mean it in a very real sense. In fact, if you look at, if you read Aristotle's De Anima, Right, where he says that the soul is the principle. We are looking for the principles. So he means in a very real sense. In so so sense, the etymology of the term principle itself is more than, say, principles of classical mechanics. That's not the way one should. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. So principle is the primary or first thing. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I really want to congratulate you on a beautiful mm -hmm. presentation of those ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, I, simple question. Okay. Did you consciously base your uh, uh, process of, of this progress that you show um, on the work of Immanuel Kant? Uh, no. You are presumably aware of Kant's concept of the transcendental unity sure. of apperception. Sure. But now, what Kant said, mm -hmm. if, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, Jonathan, uh. is that when you perceive an object, mm -hmm. although it has many parts, Mm -hmm. There is something in consciousness which holds that perception together as a whole. Sure. In modern terms, we would call it, in a sense, the gestalt. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's worth looking at what Gis Wiki has to say about sure. gestalt psychology. Well, they were very influenced by Kant. <clears throat> so. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. what you have said is that the enselved mind mm -hmm. holds together not just parts of an object, but the entire intellectual apprehension that the person goes through in, in all their memories, mm -hmm. in fact, what we would call in the West, the Western intellect, mm -hmm. that itself has to have an enselved mind mm -hmm. in order to have a transcendental unity of apperception of everything that it has ever experienced, conceived, thought, intellectualized, or so on. Mm -hmm. Is that a reasonable summary of what you've said? Um, I would definitely agree that the self, I mean, that A, you need something to unify, and B, it is the, that it is transcendental. The third, of course, is whether you can identify it with the self. I mean, I'm not sure if Kant would go that far. Well, uh, uh, this was the take on Kant that um, uh, Jonathan Shear has been teaching f for 40 years. Okay. But um, that's why I take it, because I've been familiar with okay. his work for a long time. Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, I mean, I, if somebody says you plagiarize Kant, I'm absolutely happy oh, to take that. Oh, I wasn't that. saying I mean, that. I, I, I'm I was saying, saying that you've extended right. Kant to, I'm, to... I'm very happy to be Kantian to that extent, sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, actually, recently I was doing some studies uh -huh. uh, which is related to what you're saying. My basic question is about the interrelationship between the brain and the mind. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I was reading about some uh, work done by Jeffrey M. Schwartz uh -huh. uh, on uh, treating the treatment of OCD. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, he, uh, he suggested that it is not necessarily to be treated only by uh, psychopharmacology. So he uh, took the concept of the mindfulness meditation mm -hmm. and uh, he developed this technique called uh, M MBCT, Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy. Behavior Therapy. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the implications that arise, uh, possibly arise, is that uh, the, maybe the implicit statement that the mind is a function of the, uh, you know, the dynamics of the brain need not necessarily uh, be, be true because it is possible for an individual to observe the obsessive thoughts and yet not uh, sort of re uh, react to it uh, in a way that is uh, psychopathological. Mm -hmm. But uh, w what does this say ab about the uh, implications to be drawn about the uh, sort of the interrelationship between the brain and the mind? Because it seems that the mind has the capability to co-construct, uh, you know, experiential uh, processes. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, some degree of volitional choice in doing so. Uh, okay, if I understand your point, uh, you're asking what, is, so if you take something top down like meditation, and the fact that it may influence, I mean, there's now a lot of evidence that, you know, even the, certainly the functioning of the brain is affected by meditation and maybe even the structure. That doesn't necessarily have to involve a self. So in fact, the Buddhists who are exceptionally interested in top-down effects will deny a self, right? So in that sense, um, the, the fact that there are top-down effects, it's just saying there is causality going both ways, which is different from the self as the locus of coherence. Just, but that doesn't mean that that isn't interesting because it's just saying that system level effects in the brain can also affect uh, microscopic states, which we sort of assume uh, in our daily lives anyway. Right? Selection has played a role in the development of the species. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would like to agree with you. And, and you could say that my talk was pretty vague. Myself. So um, in that sense, uh, something, uh, a, a hypothesis which says that the mind is co-constituted by dynamical relations between the brain, the body, and its environment, at some level has to be true. But I think that unless it can be fleshed out, I mean, there are some ways in which the mind is embodied and other ways in which it isn't. And similarly, some ways in which dynamics makes a difference and other ways it doesn't. And unless we have some specificity, it's a pretty empty hypothesis. And I think that unless you bring, even whether you bring it as a Buddhist or whatever, the Buddhists, for example, if you read the Abhidharma, they have very, very detailed relations between different mental states. Right? And we have to get to that micro level before it gets interesting. I think. Thank you. Yeah. Next question. So thank you uh, for the, the interesting talk, but I, I'm struggling a little bit with this in terms of what I should take away from, yeah. from this talk. And so I'm, I'm sympathetic with the idea that the brain's not a computer, that's, yeah. that's fine, and, and the yeah. importance of embodiment, that's also yeah. very yeah. nice. I enjoyed your examples of behavioral economics. Uh -huh. And the self clearly is, is a very salient part of our phenomenology. Uh -huh. However, I'm, I'm not, I find it difficult to accept this, okay, the self is then the central explanatory target, something uh -huh. like that. And you gave a nice example of cat grass syndrome, right? Uh -huh. But we also have the Qatar delusion, mm -hmm. uh, which seems to me specifically the delusion that the, the, the person with that delusion mm -hmm. does not have a self in the standard way that we think they have the self. They think they are... They don't have identity. Well, they believe they're dead, yeah. and they believe they don't exist. Nonetheless, they have experiences, and they will say things like, throw this body in the bin, and, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and their experiences are, are still somehow coherent. On the other hand, you've got other neuropsychological syndromes like balance and so on, where there's a breakdown in the global integration of environment, but, it's, but still a, a, a strong preservation of the self. There's this double dissociation there between selfhood and global integration. And then the other thing I'm struggling with is you mentioned sometimes self-organization uh -huh. and conscious experience of self. I think it's extremely, I, I would like to hear mm -hmm what you mean by relating these two things, because it's very dangerous. I mean, the way self-organization is used in complexity theory and complex mm -hmm. adaptive systems is like basically, you know, it's a property of, okay, if you put energy in an open system, you'll get organized structure sure. out. It might not, like, I don't see that necessarily has anything at all to do with right. uh, selfhood. Right. Um, I was, so let's just start from the last one. I, I was using self-organization entirely in a uh, half facetious fashion. Right? So I'm not saying that what physicists mean by self-organization is what this is, right? But rather, because that's something happens, you know, those are what happen in dissipative systems where you have energy flowing through. I mean, that's a very, very well understood to the, I mean, at least the physics part of it. So no relation. Though I think thermodynamics does have a contribution to make here. On the other hand, I, to go back to the other, the neurological examples you gave, it's precisely the fact that you have coherent, ex so because I said that the self, for me, that's where I started, is the organizer, it's, right? it's that which makes experience coherent. That's, that's the locus in which I want to start from, not the identity that this is me. Right? Because in fact, the person who says that I am dead nevertheless has coherent experience, which suggests to me that the coherence-making entity is different or at least 
has many layers, some of which can be removed, and therefore identity can be removed without coherence being removed. And that's what I'm saying. That's a more organismic conception of the unity rather than the uh, than this particular identity-driven. So, idea. what would be a specific prediction that flows from this framework, the way you describe it, as compared to the ways you're contrasting against? Um, so, one prediction would be that. In, so certainly for uh, neuropsychological situations, right, that the last thing to go would be this coherence making, right? So, so you would ra- so both Capgrass and the other one that you mentioned are examples where I would rather retain the coherence and I'm willing to even call myself dead or somebody else being an imposter than agree that there is a hole in my coherence, right? So, th- so that's a specific kind of prediction. Uh, Thank you. One uh, last question. Yeah, quickly, one minute. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh Kasturi Ramnan. I have always enjoyed your talks. Mm-hmm. I also attended your communication course. It was wonderful. Three points. One point is I do not buy your experiment of hot tea and cold coke. I want to know where it was conducted. Okay. What were the preferences of the people uh, who were conducted? Excuse me, me, shall we now? Two, I'll go to the next the one. The same people are going to be here. We can ask them later. Oh, all right. Two things. The Cambridge University has conducted an experiment of Buddhist meditation techniques on the brain uh-huh. and the sense of self of I, the end cell die which you talked of, reduces in the images of the brain compared to those in other states of mind. Mm-hmm. So I'm just putting forth an idea that perhaps there is scope for the encelled mind to become the unicelled mind. Okay. What do you think of that? I have absolutely nothing to t- say to the second. Um, it could be, uh, but uh, but for the first, I, I think that you can. There is a very simple answer. Just Google it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, next uh, last question. Yeah. Just briefly. Yeah. Um, just just going down that flow chart. Like uh-huh. I'm also interested in si- as, as science and technology studies. However, try to avoid uh-huh. my interest in that uh-huh. field, but. Uh, this uh, there's something about like how we invent things like when say the microchip and the calculator was invented add two numbers mm-hmm. to take an operator and operate into accumulator do the operation and put the out, get the output out when you're actually thinking about that process and inventing a inventing a machine you tr- in a way like trans translating the the machine the machine ma- mechanic mm-hmm. yeah well the mach- mm, machine well so this thing is M star. Yeah, Let's the M star in word of the A C H I N nation mm-hmm. uh, in the mind into a process now, mm-hmm. and then now with neuroimaging techniques and whatever resolution limit limitations we have in measurements, this there's some kind of like <clears throat> like ad hoc hypotheses going as to like how the brain adds numbers based on how we translated that. So do you do you see some kind of like <clears throat> another feedback loop happening from the ancestral mind back to the computational mind, driven by uh, some kind of limits in capacity processing in that interface? Like because we are constantly translating the mach- machinations of our mind into like um, into like inventions, and at the same time uh, extending our mind by augmenting our memory with say post-its or emails and where the real world now becomes an, a, a way in which you can augment your own memories and perception and ph- 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 phenomenological understanding of your life. Right. So is that something uh, else? Okay, so I think that the book you should read, if you haven't, is Natural Born Cyborgs by Andy Clark. Okay, well, so... Okay, the extended mind hypothesis is... Right, right. It, it comes from Carl Clark and Chalmers. But the Encel mind is not... It's compatible with all these technological extension. It's not something I think about a lot. It's very, of course, both my ideas and this entire loop is heavily influenced by cybernetic ideas. So in that sense, and since computer science itself was heavily influenced by cybernetics, I wouldn't be surprised if they're related. I just don't have anything specific to say. Thank you, Doctor.